Chapter 15 of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynoel. Chapter 15 Popular Burlesque. The more I consider that strange inversion of idolatry, which is the motive of Guy Fawkes' day, and which annually animates the by-streets with the sound of processionals and recessionals, a certain popular version of Let Us We Forget, their unveiled theme, the more I hear the cries of derision raised by the makers of the likeness of something unworshipful on the earth beneath, so much the more I am I convinced that the national humor is that of banter, and that no other kind of mirth so gains as does this upon the public taste. Here, for example, is the popular idea of a street festival. That day is as the people will actually have it, with their own invention, their own material, their own means, and their own spirit. They owe nothing on this occasion to the promptings or subscriptions of the classes that are apt to take upon themselves the direction and tutelage of the people in relation to any form of art. Here... On every 5th of November, the people have their own way with their own art, and their way is to offer the service of image-maker, reversed in the hissing and irony, to some creature of their hands. It is a wanton fancy, and perhaps no really barbarous people is capable of so overturning the innocent plan of original portraiture. To make a mental image of all things that are named to the ear or conceived in the mind, being an industrious custom of children and childish people which lapses in the age of much idle reading, the making of a material image is a still more diligent and more sedulous act, whereby the primitive man controls and caresses his own fancy. He may take arms and on, disappointed against his own work, but did he ever do that work in malice from the outset? From the statue to the doll, images are all outraged in the person of the guy. If it were but an antithesis to the citizen's idea of something admirable, which he might carry in procession on some other day, the carrying of the guy would be less gloomy, but he would hoot at a suspicious that he might admire anything so much as to make a good-looking doll in its praise. There is absolutely no image-making art in the practice of our people, except only the art of rags, and contumely, or again, if the revenge taken upon Guy were that of anger for a certain cause, the destruction would not be the work of so thin and annual malice, and of so heartless a rancor. But the single motive is that popular irony which becomes daily or so it seems, more and more the holiday temper of the majority. Mockery is the only animating impulse, and a loud incredulity is the only intelligence. They make an image of someone in whom they do not believe to deride it. Say that the guy is the effigy of an agitator in the cause of something to be desired. The street man and boy have then two motives of mocking. They think the reform to be not worth doing, and they are willing to suspect the reformer of some kind of 
hypocrisy. Perhaps the guy of this occasion is most characteristic of all guys in London. The people, having him or her to the right, do not even wait for the opportunity of their annual procession. They anticipate time and make an image when it is not November and sell it at the market of the curb. Here, moreover, the songs which some nameless one makes for the citizens perhaps is thoughtful renunciation of the making of their laws. These two seem to have for their inspiration the universal taunt. They are indeed most in vogue when they have no meaning at all. This it is that makes the successful, and here Paris is of one mind with London of the street. But short of such a triumph, and when a meaning is discernible, it is an irony. Bank holiday courtship, if the inappropriate word can be pardoned, seems to be done, in real life, entirely by banter. And it is the strangest thing to find that the banter of women by men is the most mocking in the exchange. If the burlesque of the maid's tongue is provocative, that of men's is derisive. Somewhat of the order of things as they stood before they were inverted seems to remain, nevertheless as a memory, nay, to give the inversion a kind of lagging interest. Irony is made more complete by the remembrance and by the implicit allusion to the state of courtship in other classes, countries, or times. Such an allusion, no doubt, gives all its peculiar tang and the burlesque of love. Such an allusion, no doubt, gives all its peculiar twang to the burlesque of love. With the most strange submission, these English women in their millions undergo all degrees of derision from the tongues of men who are their mates, equals, contemporaries, perhaps in some obscure sense their suitors, and in a strolling manner, with one knows not what ungainly motive of reserve, even their admirers, nor for their tongues only. For to pass the time, the holiday swain annoys the girl, and if he wears her hat, it is ten to one that he has plucked it off with a humorous disregard of her dreadful pins. We have to believe that unmocked love has existence in the streets, because of the proof that is published when a man shoots a woman who has rejected him. And from this also do we learn to believe that a woman of the burlesque classes is able to reject. But for that sign we should find little or nothing intelligible in what we see or overhear of drama of love in popular life. In its easy moments, in its leisure, at holiday time, it baffles all tradition and show us the spirit of comedy clowning after a fashion that is insular and not merely civic. You hear the same twang in country places, and whether the English maid, having, like the antique, thrown her apple at her shepherd, run into the thickets of Hampstead Heath or among sylvan trees, it seems that the most humorous things to be done by the swain would be, in the opinion in vogue, to stroll another way. Insular, I have said, because I have not seen the like of this fashion, whether in America or elsewhere in Europe. But the chief inversion of all proved summarily by the annual inversion of the worship of images on the 5th of November, is that of a sentence of Wordsworth's 
We live by admiration. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. Dry Autumn. One who has much and often protested against the season of autumn, her pathos, her chilly breakfast time, her tints, her decay, and her extraordinary popularity, saw cause one year to make a partial recantation. Autumn, until then, had seemed to be a practitioner of all the easy arts at once, or rather, she had taken the easy way with the arts of color, sentiment, suggestion, and regret. She had often encouraged and rewarded, also, the ingratitude of a whole nation for a splendid summer somewhat officiously cooling, refreshing, allaying and comforting the discontent of the victims of an English son. She had soothed the fuming citizen, and brought back the fogs of custom, he faced the skies, to which he had upturned no very attentive eye, muffled up his chin, and in many other ways curried favor. Not only did she fall in with his landscape mood, but she made herself his housemate by his fireplaces, drew his curtains, shut out her own wet winds in the streets, and became privy to the commoner comforts of man, like a wild creature tamed and conniving at human sport and schemes. Domesticated Gothic itself, or the governesses who daily by advertisement describe themselves by that same strange modern adjective, could not be more bent upon the flattery of man in his less heroic moments. Autumn, for all her show of stormy woods, is apt to be the accomplice of daily human things that lack dignity, and are, in the now accepted sense of a once noble word, comfortable. Besides, her show of stormy forests is done with an abandonment to the pathos of the moment, with dashings and underlinings. We all know the sort of letter, for instance, which answers to the message and proclamation of autumn, as she usually is in the outer world. A complete sentimentalist is she, whether in the open country or when she looks in at the lighted windows, and good-naturedly makes her voice like a very goblin's outside, for the increasing of the bourgeois bien entre. But that year all had been otherwise. Autumn had borne herself with a heroism of sunny weather. Where we had been wont to see signals of distress, and to hear the voluble outpouring of an excitable temperament, with the extremity of scattered leaves and desperate damp, we beheld an aspect of golden drought. Nothing mouldered, everything was consumed by vital fires. The gardens were strewn with smouldering soft ashes of late roses, late honeysuckle, honey-sweet clematis. The silver seeds of rows of riverside flowers took sail on their random journey with a light wind. Leaves set forth, a few at a time, with a little volley of birds, a buoyant caravel or, in the stiller weather, the infrequent fall of leaves took place quietly, with no proclamation of ruin, in the privacy within the branches. While nearly all the woods were still fresh as streams, you might see here or there was one, with an invincible summer smile, slowly consuming, in defiance of decay. Life destroyed that autumn, not death. The novelist would be at a loss had we a number of such years, he would lose the easiest landscape, for the autumn has among her facile ways the ways of allowing herself to be described by rote. But there were no regions of crimson woods and yellow, only the grave, cool, and cheerful green of the health of summer, and now and then that deep bronzing of the leaves that the sun brought to pass. Never did apples look better than in those still vigorous orchards. They shone so that lamps would hardly be brighter. The apple gathering, under such a sun, was nearly as warm and brilliant as a vintage, and indeed it was of the Italian autumn that you were reminded. There were the same sunburnt tones, the same brown health. There was the dark smile of chestnut woods as among the Apennines. For it was chiefly within the woods that the splendid autumn without pathos gave light. 
the autumn with pathos has a way there of overwhelming her many fragrances and the general odor of dead leaves generalized that year you could breathe all the several sweet scents as discriminated and distinct as those of flowers on the tops of mountains warm pine and beech as different as time and broom unconfused even the spring with her little divided breezes of hawthorn rose and lilac were not more various moreover while some of the woods were green none of the fields were so in their sunburnt colors were to be seen autumn tints of a far different beauty from that of a gaudy decay dry autumn is a general lover of simplicity and she sweeps a landscape with the long plain colors that take their variations from the light when the country looks burnt up as they say who are ungrateful for the sun then are these colors most tender grass that had lost its delicacy in the day when the last hay was carried gets it again for a little time it was new reaped of something too hard a green then came dry autumn along and softened it into a hundred exquisite browns dry autumn does beautiful things in sepia as the watercolor artist did in the early days and draws divine brown turners of the first manner the fields and hedgerows must needs fade and the sun made the fading quick with the bloom of brown for one great meadow so softly gilded i would give all the scarlet and yellow trees that ever made a steaming autumn gorgeous all the crimson of the rhine valleys all the patched and spotted walnut leaves of the multal by boppard and the little trees that change so suddenly to their yellow of decay in groups as the foot of the ruins of sternberg and liebenstein every one of their branches disguised in the same bright insignificant unhopeful color an autumn so rare should not close without a recorded hail and farewell spring was not braver summer was not sweeter that year's great sun called upon a great spirit in all the riverside woods those woods did not grow cold they yielded to their last sunset end of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Mayno. Chapter 17 The Plaid. It is disconcerting to hear of the plaid in India. Our dyes, we know, they use in the silk mills of Bombay, with the deplorable result that their old clothes are dull and unintentionally falsified with infelicitous decay. The Hindus are a washing people, and the sun and water that do but dim, soften, and warm the native vegetable dyes to the last do but burlesque the aniline. Magenta is bad enough when it is itself, but the worst of magenta is that it spoils but poorly. No bad modern forms and no bad modern colors spoil well, and spoiling is an important process. It is a test, one of the ironical tests that come too late with their proofs. London portico houses will make some such ruins as do chemical dyes, which undergo no use but derides them, no accidents but caricature them this is an old enough grievance but the plaid the plaid is the scotsman's contribution to the decorative art of the world scotland has no other indigenous decoration in his most admirable lecture on the two paths ruskin acknowledged with a passing misgiving that his highlanders had little art and the misgiving was but passing because he considered how fatally wrong was the art of india it never represents a natural fact it forms its compositions out of meaningless fragments of colour and flowing of line it will not draw a man but an eight-armed monster it will not draw a flower but only a spiral or a zigzag because of this aversion from nature the hindu and his art tended to evil we read but of the scot we are told you will find upon reflection that all the highest points of the scottish character are connected with impressions derived straight from the natural scenery of their country what then about the plaid 
where is the natural fact there if the indian by practising a non-natural art of spirals and zigzags cuts himself off from all possible sources of healthy knowledge or natural delight to what did the good and healthy highlander condemn himself by practising the art of plaid a spiral may be found in the vine and a zigzag in the lightning but where in nature is the plaid to be found there is surely no curve or curl that can be drawn by a designing hand but is a play upon some infinitely various natural fact the smoke of the cigarette more sensitive in motion than breath or blood has its waves so multitudinously inflected and reinflected with such flights and such delays it flows and bends upon currents of so subtle influence and impulse as to include the most active impetuous and lingering curls ever drawn by the finest oriental hand and that is not a hindu hand nor any hand of aryan race the japanese has captured the curve of the section of a sea wave its flow relaxation and fall but this is a single movement whereas the line of cigarette smoke in a still room fluctuates in twenty delicate directions no it is impossible to accept the saying that the poor spiral or scroll of a human design is anything but a participation in the innumerable curves and curls of nature now the plaid is not only cut off from natural sources as ruskin says of oriental design the plaid is not only cut off from nature and cut off from nature by the yard for it is to be measured off in inorganic quantity but it is even a kind of intentional contradiction of all natural or vital forms and it is equally defiant of vital tone and of vital color everywhere in nature tone is gradual and between the fainting of a tone and the failing of a curve there is a charming analogy but the tartan insists that its tone shall be invariable and sharply defined by contrasts of dark and light as to color it has colors not color but that plaid should now go so far afield as to decorate the noble garment of the indies is ill news true ruskin saw nothing but cruelty and corruption in indian life or art but let us hear an indian maxim in regard to those who in cruel places are ready sufferers there says the mahabharata where women are treated with respect the very gods are said to be filled with joy women deserve to be honoured serve ye them bend your will before them by honouring women ye are sure to attain to the fruition of all things and the rash teachers of our youth would have persuaded us that this generous lesson was first learned in teutonic forests nothing but extreme lowliness can well reply or would probably be suffered to reply to this hindu profession of reverence accordingly the woman so honoured makes an offering of cakes and oil to the souls of her mother-in-law grandmother-in-law and great-grandmother-in-law in gratitude for their giving her a good husband and to go back for a moment to ruskin's contrast of the two races it was assuredly under the stress of some too rash reasoning that he judged the lovely art of the east as a ministrant to superstition cruelty and pleasure whether wrought upon the temple the sword or the girdle the innocent art of innocent hindu women for centuries decked their most modest heads their dedicated and sequestered beauty their child-loving breasts and consecrated chambers End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of sears runaway and other essays this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roman Noble. RomanNoble.com. Sears Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. Two Burdens. One is on the breast and clings there with arms, and one on the back and clings with thongs. The burden of the back bows the body, turns the face from the sky 
narrows the lungs and flattens the foot, takes away the flight and the dance from the gait of man and ties him towards the earth, not only in the way of nature, by means of his arched feet, but by a heavy lean upon his shoulders and his brows. It is the fardel that makes this vital figure to be subject visibly, and at several points, to that law of gravitation which, in a state of liberty, it uses to withstand, to countervail, to leap from, to walk with, making the universal tether elastic. Bend into this supple spine that can lift itself like a snake erect, with something better than mere balance, with life and the active will, bend the back and at once gravitation takes hold of the loins and grasps the knees and pulls upon the shoulders and the neck feels the weight of an abject head. Wherever women are told off to hard, open-air labor, we shall find among them a lower class of their own kind, poor where all are poor, and straining at the task where all are laboring, who walk the dust with burdens on their backs. Loads of field labor are these, or of the labor in a fishing port, and large in proportion to their weight. Too large to be bound close and carried on the head, too wide to be borne on the shoulder, too unwieldy for the clasp of arms. Among American Indians, we are told, the women carry the tent so, and the gear of a demangement, and the warrior himself, upon his goods, not seldom. In the agriculture of the European continent, the women carry the large loads thus, the refuse is laid upon them, and all that is bound up for burning. They are the gleaners, not of wheat, but of terrors. Or they carry fodder for the imprisoned cattle, disappearing as they walk bowed, quenched, hooded, and hidden with hay. Women who bear this load do not prosper. They have a downward look, albeit not as conspirators, and in them the earth carries a burden like their own, or but little more buoyant. Stones off the face of the stony fields, huge sheaves of stalks and husks after granaries are filled. Fuel and forage, bent from the stature of women, those who bear those bundles go near the earth that gave them, and breathe her dust. In Austria, where women carry the hod and climb the ladder, in the Rhineland, where a cart goes along the valley roads drawn by a woman harnessed with a cow, even here I think the hardship hardly so great as where the burden is laid upon the bent back of her whose arms are too small or too weak to grasp it. For after long use and such carrying, the figure is no longer fit for habitual erection, and the use is established with those women who are so loaded. It is not that all the laboring women of such a village or such a seaport are burdened in their turn with the burden of the back. It is rather that a class is formed, a class of the burdened and the bent, and to that class belong all ages. Childbearing women are in that sisterhood. No stronger women can be seen than the upright women of Bologna, to whom then but the bent are due the many cripples, the many dwarfs, the ill-boned stragglers of the vigorous population, the many children growing awry, the many old people shuffling towards misshapen graves. There is manifestly another burden, familiar and accustomed to the figure of woman. This does not bend her back, nor withdraw her eyes from the distance, nor rank her with the haggard waste of fields. It is borne in front, and she breasts the world with it, shoulder high, and it is her ballast. So loaded she stands like the Dresden Raphael, and there is no bearer of sword and buckler more erect. It is, by the way, a curious sign of indignity of race, or, if not indignity, provincialism, in the more extremely oriental people, that a Japanese woman carries her child on her back and not upon her arm. It is a charming infant, and the mother looks no more than a gentle child. With the little creature bound to her back, she carries a soft lantern in a mild blue light. She is not of a classic race, and she shuffles on her subordinate way, an irresponsible creature, who must not proffer opinions except by way of quotation, and is scarcely of the inches that measure the landscape or of the aspect that fronts the sky. But whence is this now prevalent desire to slip the nobler and bear the nobler burden? It is not long since an American woman wrote a book, Women and Economics, urging equal labor upon women. By the analogy of animals that know no distinction between a strong sex and a weak, nor between a free sex and one confined to the pen, or the lair, or the cover by the care of little ones. The reply seems too obvious that the children of men are more helpless, and are helpless for a longer time, even in proportion to their longer life, than the offspring of other living creatures. The children of men have to be carried. This author complains that women are economically dependent upon men, and she finds that the world has misty ideas upon the subject. 
if those misty ideas are to the effect that a woman who keeps house for the service of herself her husband and other inmates gives her work in return for maintenance and is not a dependent but a colleague i must wish that ideas mistily held were often so just and ideas vaguely believed were often so well founded those who charge the husband with employing his wife choose to neglect the fact that she is mistress and hostess as well as servant or housekeeper ministering to herself and to the guest in whose company she has pleasure and to whose respect she has a right our economic author proceeds we are the only animal species in which the sex relation is also an economic factor we have not been accustomed to face this fact beyond our loose generalization that it was natural and that other animals did so too has anyone really been so rash as to aver that other animals did so too the obvious truth is that other animals do otherwise but that whatever they do they make no rule or example for man again whatever the economic value of the domestic industry of women is they do not get it the women who do the most work get the least money and yet but now they were charged with getting it too dependently or rather with having it got for them by man is this writer indeed misled by the mere word money which she here lets slip he nearly persuades me to go on all fours sighs voltaire rising rising erect reluctantly one may almost say from the reading of rousseau end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of series runaway and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. The Unready. It is rashly said that the senses of children are quick. They are, on the contrary, unwieldy in turning, unready in reporting, until advancing age teaches them agility. This is not lack of sensitiveness, but mere length of process. For instance, a child nearly newly born is cruelly startled by a sudden crash in the room. A child who has never learnt to fear, and is merely overcome by the shock of sound. Nevertheless, that shock of sound does not reach the conscious hearing, or the nerves, but after some moments, nor before some moments more, is the sense of the shock expressed. The sound travels to the remoteness and seclusion of the child's consciousness, as the roar of a gun travels to listeners half a mile away. So it is, too, with pain, which has learnt to be so instant and eager with us of later age that no point of time is lost in its touches. Direct as the unintercepted message of great and candid eyes, unhampered by trivialities, even so immediate is the communication of pain. But you could count five between the prick of a surgeon's instrument upon a baby's arm, and a little whimper that answers it. The child is then too young, also, to refer the feeling of pain to the arm that suffers it. Even when pain has groped its way to his mind, it hardly seems to bring local tidings thither. The baby does not turn his eyes in any degree towards his arm, or towards the side that is so vexed with vaccination. He looks in any other direction at haphazard, and cries at random. See, too, how slowly the unpractised apprehension of an older child trudges after the nimbleness of a conjurer. It is the greatest failure to take these little gobe mouches to a good conjurer. His successes leave them cold, for they had not yet understood what it was the good man meant to surprise them withal. The amateur it is who really astonishes them. They cannot come up even with your amateur beginner, performing at close quarters, whereas the master of his craft on a platform runs quite away at the outset from the lagging senses of his honest audience. You may rob a child of his dearest play to table, almost from under his ingenious eyes, send him off in chase of it, and have it in its place and off again ten times before the little breathless boy has begun to perceive in what direction his sweets have been snatched. Teachers of young children should therefore teach themselves a habit of awaiting, should surround themselves with pauses of patience. The simple little processes of logic that arrange the grammar of a common sentence are too quick for these young blunderers, who cannot use two pronouns, but they must confuse them. I never found that a young child, one of something under nine years, was able to say, I send them my love, 
at the first attempt. It will be, I send me my love. I send them their love. They send me my love. Not, of course, through any confusion of understanding, but because of the tardy setting of words in order with the thoughts. The child visibly grapples with the difficulty, and is beaten. It is no doubt this unreadiness that causes little children to like twice-told tales and foregone conclusions in their games. They are not eager, for a year or two yet to come, for surprises. If you hide, and they cannot see you hiding, their joy in finding you is comparatively small. But let them know perfectly well what cupboard you are in, and they will find you with shouts of discovery. The better the hiding place is understood between you, the more lively the drama. They make a convention of art for their play. The younger the children, the more dramatic. And when the house is filled with outcries of laughter from the breathless breast of a child, it is that he is pretending to be surprised at finding his mother where he bade her pretend to hide. This is the comedy that never tires. Let the elder who cannot understand its charm beware how he tries to put a more intelligible form of delight in the place of it. For, if not, he will find that children also have a manner of substitution, and that they will put half-hearted laughter in the place of their natural impetuous clamors. It is certain that very young children like to play upon their own imaginations, and enjoy their own short game. There is something so purely childlike in the delays of a child that any exercise asking for the swift apprehension of later life, for the flashes of understanding and action, from the mind and members of childhood, is no pleasure to see. The piano, for instance, as experts understand it, and even as the moderately trained may play it, claims all the immediate action, the instantaneousness, most unnatural to childhood. There may possibly be feats of skill to which young children could be trained without this specific violence directed upon the thing characteristic of our age, their unreadiness, but virtuosity at the piano cannot be one of them. It is no delight, indeed, to see the shyness of children, or anything that is theirs, conquered and beaten. But their poor little slowness is so distinctively their own, and must needs be physiologically so proper to their years, so much a natural condition of the age of their brain, that of all childishness, it is the one that the world should have the patience to attend upon, the humanity to foster, and the intelligence to understand. It is true that movements of young children are quick, but a very little attention would prove how many apparent disconnections there are between the lively motion and the first impulse. It is not the brain that is quick. If, on a voyage in space, electricity takes thus much time, and light thus much, and sound thus much, there was one little jogging traveler that would arrive after the others had forgotten their journey, and this is the perception of a child. Surely our own memories might serve to remind us how in our childhood we inevitably missed the principal point in any procession or pageant intended by our elders to furnish us with a historical remembrance for the future. It was not our mere vagueness of understanding. It was the unwieldiness of our senses, of our reply to the suddenness of the grown-up. We lived through the important moments of the passing of an emperor at a different rate from theirs. We stared long in the wake of his majesty, and of anything else of interest, every flash of movement that got telegraphic answers from our parents' eyes, left us stragglers. We fell out of all ranks. Among the sights proposed for our instruction, that which befitted us best was an eclipse of the moon, done at leisure. In good time we found the moon in the sky. In good time the eclipse set in and made reasonable progress. We kept up with everything. It is too often required of children that they should adjust themselves to the world, practiced and alert. But it would be more to the purpose that the world should adjust itself to children in all its dealings with them. Those who run and keep together have to run at the pace of the tardiest. But we are apt to command instant obedience, stripped of the little pauses that a child, while very young, cannot act without. It is not a child of ten or twelve that needs them so. It is the young creature who has but lately ceased to be a baby, slow to be startled. We have but to consider all that it implies of the loitering senses, and of an unprepared consciousness, this capacity for receiving a great shock from a noise, and this perception of the shock after two or three appreciable moments, if we would know anything of the moments of a baby. 
even as we must learn that our time, when it is long, is too long for children, so must we learn that our time, when it is short, is too short for them. When it is exceedingly short, they cannot, without an unnatural effort, have any perception of it. When children do not see the jokes of the elderly, and disappoint expectation in other ways, only less intimate, the reason is almost always there. The child cannot turn in mid-career. He goes fast. But the impetus took place moments ago. End of chapter 19「Packed into tight bundles by so hard and resolute a hand that the petals of the flowers never afterwards lose the creases, is a type of the child. Nothing but the unfolding, which is as yet in the non-existing future, can explain the manner of the close folding of character. In both flower and child it looks much as though the process has been the reverse of what it was, as though a finished and open thing had been folded up into the bud so plainly and certainly is the future implied and the intention of compressing and folding close made manifest with the other incidents of childish character the crowd of impulses called naughtiness is perfectly perceptible it would seem heartless to say how soon the naughty child who is often an angel of tenderness and charm affectionate beyond the capacity of his fellows and a very ascetic of penitence when the time comes opens early his brief campaigns and raises the standard of revolt as soon as he is capable of the desperate joys of disobedience but even the naughty child is an individual and must not be treated in the mass he is numerous indeed but not general and to describe him you must take the unit with all his incidents and his organic qualities as they are take then for instance one naughty child in the reality of his life he is but six years old slender and masculine and not wronged by long hair curls or effeminate dress his face is delicate and too often haggard with tears of penitence that justice herself would be glad to spare him some beauty he has and his mouth especially is so lovely as to seem not only angelic but itself an angel he has absolutely no self-control and his passions find him without defence they come upon him in the midst of his usual brilliant gaiety and cut short the frolic comedy of his fine spirits. Then for a wild hour he is the enemy of the laws. If you imprison him you may hear his resounding voice as he takes a running kick at the door, shouting his justification in unconquerable rage. I'm good now is made as emphatic as a shot by the blow of his heel upon the panel. But if the moment of forgiveness is deferred in the hope of a more promising repentance, it is only too likely that he will betake himself to a hostile silence and use all the revenge yet known to his imagination. "'Darling mother, open the door,' cries his touching voice at last. But if the answer should be, "'I must leave you for a short time for punishment,' the storm suddenly thunders again. "'There! Crash!' I have broken a plate, and I'm glad it is broken into such little pieces that you can't mend it. I'm going to break the electric light. When things are at this pass, there is one way and only one to bring the child to an overwhelming change of mind. But it is a way that would be cruel used more than twice or thrice in his whole career of tempest and defiance. This is to let him see that his mother is troubled. Oh, don't cry. Oh, don't be sad, he roars, unable still to deal with his own passionate anger which is still dealing with him. With his kicks of rage he suddenly mingles a dance of apprehension lest his mother should have tears in her eyes. Even while he is still explicitly impenitent and defiant he tries to pull her round to the light that he may see her face. It is but a moment before the other passion of remorse comes to make havoc of the helpless child and the first passion of anger is quelled outright. Only to a trivial eye is there nothing tragic in the sight of these great passions within the small frame, the small will, 
and in a word the small nature when a large and sombre fate befalls a little nature and the stage is too narrow for the action of a tragedy the disproportion has sometimes made a mute and unexpressed history of actual life or sometimes a famous book it is the manifest core of george eliot's story of adam Bede, where the suffering of hetty is as it were the eye of the storm all is expressive around her but she is hardly articulate the book is full of words preachings speeches daily talk aphorisms but a space of silence remains about her in the midst of the story and the disproportion of passion the inner disproportion is at least as tragic as that disproportion of fate and action it is less intelligible and leads into the intricacies of nature which are more difficult than the turn of events it seems then that this passionate play is acted within the narrow limits of a child's nature far oftener than in those of an adult and finely formed nature and this evidently because there is unequal force at work within a child unequal growth and a jostling of powers and energies that are hurrying to their development and pressing for exercise in life it is this helpless inequality this untimeliness that makes the guileless comedy mingling with the tragedies of a poor child's day he knows thus much that life is troubled around him and that the fates are strong he implicitly confesses the strong hours of antique song this same boy the tempestuous child of passion and revolt went out with quiet cheerfulness for a walk lately saying as his cap was put on now mother you are going to have a little peace this way of accepting his own condition is shared by a sister a very little older who being of an equal and gentle temper and disposed to violence of every kind and tender to all without disquiet observes the boy's brief frenzies as a citizen observes the climate she knows the signs quite well and can at any time give the explanation of some particular outburst but without any attempt to go in search of further or more original causes still less is she moved by the virtuous indignation that is the least charming of the ways of some little girls elle ne fait que constanti her equanimity has never been overset by the wildest of his moments and she has witnessed them all it is needless to say that she is not frightened by his drama for nature takes care that her young creature shall not be injured by sympathies nature encloses them in the innocent indifference that preserves their brains from the more harassing kinds of distress even the very frenzy of rage does not long dim or depress the boy it is his repentance that makes him pale and nature here has been rather forced perhaps with no very good result often must a mother wish that she might for a few years govern her child as far as he is governable by the lowest motives trivial punishments and paltry rewards rather than by any kind of appeal to his sensibilities she would wish to keep the words right and wrong away from his childish ears but in this she is not seconded by her lieutenants the child himself is quite willing to close with her plans in so far as he is able and is reasonably interested in the results of her experiments he wishes her attempts in his regard to have a fair chance let's hope i'll be good all to-morrow he says with the peculiar cheerfulness of his ordinary voice i do hope so old man then i'll get my penny mother i was only naughty once yesterday if i have only one naughtiness to-morrow will you give me a half penny no reward except for real goodness all day long all right it is only too probable that this system adopted only after the failure of other ways of reform will be greatly disapproved as one of bribery it may however be curiously inquired whether all kinds of rewards might not equally be burlesqued by that word and whether any government spiritual or civil has ever even professed to deny rewards moreover those who would not give a child a penny for being good will not hesitate to find him a penny for being naughty and rewards and punishments must stand or fall together the more logical objection will be that goodness is ideally the normal condition and that it should have therefore no explicit extraordinary result whereas naughtiness being abnormal should have a visible and unusual sequel to this the rewarding mother may reply that it is not reasonable to take goodness in a little child of strong passions as the normal condition the natural thing for him is to give full sway to impulses that are so violent as to overbear his powers 
But after all, the controversy returns to the point of practice. What is the thought or threat or promise that will stimulate the weak will of the child in the moment of rage and anger to make a sufficient resistance? If the will were naturally as well developed as the passions, the stand would be soon made and soon successful. But as it is, there must needs be a bracing by the suggestion of joy or fear. Let then the stimulus be of a mild and strong kind at once, and mingled with the thought of distant pleasure. To meet the suffering of rage and frenzy by the suffering of fear is assuredly to make of the little unquiet mind a battle-place of feelings too hurtfully tragic. The penny is mild and strong at once, with its still distant but certain joys of purchase, the promise and hope break the mood of misery, and the will takes heart to resist and conquer. It is only in the lesser naughtiness that he is master of himself, the lesser the evil fit the more deliberate. So that his mother, knowing herself to be not greatly feared, once tried to mimic the father's voice with a menacing, What's that noise? The child was persistently crying and roaring on an upper floor in contumacy against his French nurse, when the baritone and threatening question was sent peeling up the stairs. The child was heard to pause, and listen, and then to say to his nurse, C'est n'est pas monsieur, c'est madame, and then, without further loss of time, to resume the interrupted clamors. Obviously with a little creature of six years there are two things mainly to be done to keep the delicate brain from the evil of the present excitement, especially the excitement of painful feeling, and to break the habit of passion. Now that we know how certainly the special cells of the brain which are locally affected by pain and anger become hypertrophied by so much use, and all too ready for use in the future at the slightest stimulus, we can no longer slight the importance of habit. Any means, then, that can succeed in separating a little child from the habit of anger does fruitful work for him in the helpless time of his childhood. The work is not easy, but a little thought should make it easy for the elders to avoid the provocation which they, who should ward off provocations, are apt to bring about by sheer carelessness. It is only in childhood that our race knows such physical abandonment to sorrow and tears as a child's despair and the theatre with us must needs copy childhood if it would catch the note and action of a creature without hope. End of chapter 20. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 21 of Series Runaway and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Series Runaway and Other Essays by Alice Maynell. The Child of Subsiding Tumult There is a certain year that is winged, as it were, against the flight of time. It does so move, and yet withstands time's movement. It is full of pauses that are due to the energy of change, has bounds and rebounds, and when it is most active, then it is longest. It is not long with languor. It has room for remoteness, and leisure for oblivion. It takes great excursions against time, and travels so as to enlarge its hours. This certain year is any one of the early years of fully conscious life, and therefore it is of all the dates. The child of tumult has been living amply and changefully through such a year, his eighth. It is difficult to believe that his is a year of the self-same date as that of the adult, the men who do not breast their days. For them is the inelastic, or but slightly elastic, movement of things. Month matched with month shows a fairly equal length. Men and women never travel far from yesterday, nor is their morrow in a distant light. There is recognition and familiarity between their seasons. But the child of tumult has infinite prospects in his year. Forgetfulness and surprise set his east and his west at immeasurable distance. His lethe runs in the cheerful sun. You look on your own little adult year, and in imagination enlarge it, because you know it to be the contemporary of his. Even she who is quite old, if she have a vital fancy, may face a strange and great extent of a few years of her life still to come his years 
the years she is to live at his side reason seems to be making good her rule in this little boy's life not so much by slow degrees as by sudden and fitful accessions his speech is yet so childish that he chooses for a toy with blushes of pleasure a little duck what can walk but with a beautifully clear accent he greets his mother with a colloquial question well darling do you know the latest the what the latest do you know the latest and then he tells his news generally it must be owned with some reference to his own wrongs on another occasion the unexpected little phrase was varied the news of the war then raging distressed him a thousand of the side he favored had fallen the child then came to his mother's room with the question have you heard the saddest moreover the saddest caused him several fits of perfectly silent tears which seized him during the day on his walks or at other moments of recollection from such great causes arise such little things some of his grief was for the nation he admired and some was for the triumph of his brother whose sympathies were on the other side and who perhaps did not spare his sensibilities the tumults of a little child's passions of anger and grief growing fewer as he grows older rather increase than lessen in their painfulness there is a fuller consciousness of complete capitulation of all the childish powers to the overwhelming compulsion of anger this is not temptation the word is too weak for the assault of a child's passion upon his will that little will is taken captive entirely and before the child was seven he knew that it was so such a consciousness leaves all babyhood behind and condemns the child to suffer for a certain passage of his life he is neither unconscious of evil as he was nor strong enough to resist it as he will be the time of the subsiding of the tumult is by no means the least pitiable of the phases of human life happily the recovery from each trouble is ready and sure so that the child who had been abandoned to naughtiness with all his will in an entire consent to the gloomy possession of his anger and who had later undergone a haggard repentance has his captivity suddenly turned again like rivers in the south forget it he had wept in a kind of extremity of remorse forget it darling and don't be sad and it is he happily who forgets the wasted look of his pale face is effaced by the touch of a single cheerful thought and five short minutes can restore the ruin as though a broken little german town should in the twinkling of an eye be restored as no architect could restore it should be made fresh strong and tight again looking like a full box of toys as a town was wont to look in the new days of old when his ruthless angers are not in possession the child shows the growth of this tardy reason that quickened is hereafter to do so much for his peace and dignity by the sweetest consideration denied a second handful of strawberries and seeing quite clearly that the denial was enforced reluctantly he makes haste to reply it doesn't matter darling at any sudden noise in the house his beautiful voice with all of its little difficulties of pronunciation is heard with a sedulous reassurance it's all right mother nobody hurted ourselves he is not surprised so as to forget this gentle little duty which was never required of him but is of his own devising according to the opinion of his dear and admired american friend he says all these things good and evil with an english accent and at the american play his english accent was irrepressible it is too comic no it's too comic he called in his enjoyment being the only perfectly fearless child in the world he will not consent to the conventional shyness in public whether he be the member of an audience or of a congregation but makes himself perceptible and even when he has a desperate thing to say in the moment of absolute revolt such a thing as i can't like you mother which anon he will recant with convulsions of distress he has to speak the thing he will and when he recants it is not for fear if such a child could be ruled or approximately ruled for inquisitorial government could hardly be so much as attempted 
by some small means adapted to his size and to his physical aspect it would be well for his health but that seems at times impossible by no effort can his elders altogether succeed in keeping tragedy out of the life that is so unready for it against great emotions no one can defend him by any forethought he is their subject and to see him thus devoted and thus wrung thus wrecked by tempests inwardly so that you can feel grief as him actually by the heart recalls the reluctance the question wherewith you perceive the interior grief of poetry or of a devout life cannot the muse cannot the saint you ask live with something less than this if this is the truer life it seems hardly supportable in like manner it should be possible for a child of seven to come through his childhood with griefs that should not so closely involve him but should deal with the easier sentiments despite all his simplicity the child has by way of inheritance for he has never heard them the self-excusing fictions of our race accused of certain acts of violence and unable to rebut the charge with any effect he flies to the old convention i didn't know what i was doing he avers using a great deal of gesticulation to express the temporary distraction of his mind darling after the nurse slapped me as hard as she could i didn't know what i was doing so i suppose i pushed her with my foot his mother knows as well as does tolstoy that men and children know what they are doing and are the more intently aware as the stress of feeling makes the moments more tense and she will not admit a plea which her child might have learned from the undramatic authors he has never read far from repenting of her old system of rewards and far from taking fright at the name of a bribe the mother of the child of tumult has only to wish she had at command rewards ample and varied enough to give the shock of hope and promise to the heart of the little boy and change his passion at its height end of chapter twenty one end of series runaway and other essays by alice maynell